it's time for our lecture on the integumentary system. This is the first system that we're going to cover in a and P1. In fact, it's one of the four systems we're going to do. We're going to do the integumentary, skeletal, nervous, and muscular, all in a and P1. So we only have four more things to do this semester when you look at it that way. That's not too bad. All right, let's get going. If we're talking about the integumentary system, we are number one talking about the skin. Integument means skin. Integument is the skin. Now, not only is the skin known as the integument, it's also called the cutaneous membrane as well. So skin, integument, cutaneous membrane, those are three synonyms. In AMP class, we like to have at least three different names for the same thing. It makes it a lot more fun. Also included in the system are things that are associated with and derived from the skin, including sweat glands, which of course make sweat. Sebaceous glands, which make an oily secretion called sebum. And then there's good old hair and good old nails. We are going to talk a bit about sweat glands, sebaceous glands, and hair. We're kind of going to ignore the anatomy of nails. It's all sorts of good names for the different parts of the nails, but we got to draw the line somewhere. We can't do everything. Okay, let's get started with that skin. What does it do for us? What does this system do? Four big functions. Protection is number one. This is totally unsurprising. I mean, you're sitting there like, duh, of course it protects me. It's covering me. Yeah, skin, the integumentary system, protects you. It protects you from pathogens. Remember, pathogens are disease-causing organisms. It protects you from the UV radiation that can potentially cause cancer. It protects you from dehydration. Your skin helps keep water on the inside, doesn't let it evaporate except when it should. And also just protects you from, like, physical injury. You know, we're always damaging our skin to some degree, right? If we didn't have that protective covering, things would be a lot worse. Okay, besides protection, what else is skin involved in? It's involved in the production of vitamin D. And you know you need vitamin D for strong bones, strong teeth. And there's a little more to that story. We also use the integumentary system to sense things like heat, touch. And it even helps us regulate our body temperature. So these are some very important functions. Skin plays a big role in maintaining our body's homeostasis. All right. Why don't we have an extra credit question right quickly off the bat? So, I want you to pick the two functions that are listed here. I want two functions that oppose one another. What that means, what I mean by this, okay, if they're opposing one another, when you do one, when you're better at one, Let's type this. When you're better at one of the functions, you actually get worse at the other. So I want you to tell me the two functions where getting better at one makes you worse at the other. And as always, email me your answer. Email it before you take your test. Can't email me afterwards. Doesn't count then. So definitely do that. Okay. Got that extra credit out of the way. Let's talk about that skin. Two big chunks to skin. There's an outer superficial part, the kind of reddish bracket here, called the epidermis. Then a deep, substantive part called the dermis. 
Dermis literally means skin. Epidermis on top of the skin. Now, of course, we met these guys in lab. If you've done that lab, of course you've done that lab. If you're doing this lecture video, you better have done that lab already. So we know some things already. Like, we know the epidermis is made out of stratified squamous epithelium. We know that means that it is an epithelium, because it says epithelium, which means it's adjacent to a free space, like the exterior. We know stratified means many layers of cells. Squamous means the apical cells are flat. Now, the dermis is going to have some areolar connective tissue, especially as we get more superficial, plus dense irregular connective tissue down a little bit deeper. So this is the very basic beginning components of the skin. If we look at this, this is a micrograph, a microscopic picture of skin. I want you to immediately figure out which is the epidermis and which is the dermis. All right, you ready? What's the black arrow? Shout it out. What's the blue arrow? Yell it loudly. Let people know you're studying anatomy and physiology. They should have heard you shout out, epidermis. Then a moment later, they should have heard you shout out, dermis. Because epidermis is here. There's our free space. Dermis is down here. Look how big that dermis is. Dermis is big and strong and helps give your skin structure. Somebody on an exam once, back when, before, while we were still in class and not like doing videos and stuff, someone wrote that the dermis structurizes the skin. And I was like, that is a fantastic new verb. I love it. So you're welcome to use that anytime you like. Okay, let's keep going. There is something under the skin that we got to mention, but we got to let we got to make sure we understand that it is not actually part of the skin. And that is this region called the hypodermis. Hypo, beneath, dermis, skin. So it's beneath the skin, deep to the dermis. It is not actually part of the dermis. It is also called the superficial fascia. Fascia is actually the connective tissue that wraps around, like, your muscles, for example. And muscles are deep to the skin, and muscles are deep to the hypodermis. So this connective tissue... The hypodermis, by the way, is connective tissue. The hypodermis is called the superficial fascia. Now, if we look at it, helpfully, it says hypo right here. This is hypodermis. Now, I want you to very quickly, with alacrity, tell me what kind of tissue this is. What kind of tissue is my cursor dancing upon? Yell it out. And I'm hoping you said adipose tissue. If you did, you are correct. Now, the adipose tissue in your hypodermis is going to help to attach your skin to, your, to underlying structures like your muscles. It also, because it is made of adipose tissue, it is very good for thermal insulation. We know that's one of the things adipose tissue is good at. Insulation, keeping your heat on the inside. And of course, because adipose tissue stores fat, we know that the hypodermis must be a must serve the role of energy storage. Okay. That's like pretty much it we're going that we're going to talk about the hypodermis. We do see it on the model over here as well. All right, let's talk about that epidermis. We know it is a stratified squamous epithelium. Epithelium because it's on a body surface next to a free space. Stratified because it is multi-multi-layered. This is super duper thick right here, this particular epidermis. The apical layers of cells here are squamous. They're flat. The multitude of layers gives us a great deal of protection. And that is the number one job of your epidermis, protection. Now, the vast majority of the cells in your epidermis 
are these cells called keratinocytes? Keratinocytes. They're called keratinocytes. So almost all of the cells we can see here are keratinocytes. They are called keratinocytes because they make and eventually are filled up with a protein called keratin. At the top here, the cells up here are just dead bags of keratin. Now, keratin is this fibrous, waterproof protein. And the fibrosity, the waterproofiness, goes back to this idea of protection. Protecting us from damage, the strength protects from damage. And the waterproofness protects us from dehydration. Keratin, of course, is also found in your hair. It's found in your nails. Um, the rhinoceros's horn is made out of keratin. Same stuff as in fingernails. Same stuff that's in these apical cells up here. Okay. There are other cells besides keratinocytes. There are melanocytes, which, as their name suggests are going to produce the pigment melanin. There are tactile cells. Tactile, it's a good vocab word. Tactile means, refers to your sense of touch. There are also cells called epidermal dendritic cells. Their name doesn't quite jump out and tell me what they do, but we're going to learn about them in a second. So these are the other varieties of epidermal cells besides the keratinocytes. Now we're starting with melanocytes. Melanocytes are going to make the pigment melanin. Melanin is made in the melanocytes. This is a melanocyte, this octopus-looking cell here. There's, it's got like a main body to it with the nucleus in there. It's got all these arms that come out, and the arms have arms. So this melanocyte is making melanin. It's got a lot of organelles in here because it's doing a lot of production. It needs machinery, right? It costs energy to make melanin. So, hey, look, a lot of mitochondria. Structure is matching function. Now, the melanocytes are few. The keratinocytes are many. The melanocytes have to give the melanin to the keratinocytes. So the melanocytes... That's why they have all of these arms, and the arms have arms. With more arms, you get more surface area. You can touch more keratinocytes. And you can transfer that melanin to the keratinocytes. The melanin then protects the nucleus of the keratinocytes protects the nucleus, protects the DNA, in other words, from the deleterious effects of UV radiation. We can see some actual melanocytes, the darker stained cells down here. Here's one, here's the body. You can see his legs coming up like that. There's another one with his legs, another one right there. Now, what I love about this diagram over here is how the melanin granules are clustered on the sunny side of the nucleus. The free space would be up here at the top. Sun's rays are coming in here, and the melanin granules are on that sunny side. I don't know if it's quite that perfect in the actual real body, but kind of like the idea. All right. All right. There are, of course, different types of melanin. There are different degrees of melanin in our skin makes perfect sense okay on that note let's talk about tactile cells for a moment they used to be called merkel cells after herr merkel who did all the important work with them merkel cells and i'll point out a merkel cell right down here there he is right there, a tactile cell, associated with a nerve ending. So if you were to lightly poke right here, that poke, the pressure wave, the pressure wave goes down, 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 and deforms the tactile cell. 
the tactile cell, upon being physically deformed, will release chemicals that stimulate the neighboring nerve cell we see right here. Neighboring nerve cell then sends a signal to your spinal cord. Spinal cord tells the brain, letting you know that there is a bug crawling across your skin. All right. That's pretty much it for my tactile cells. Um, do you think you have the same density of tactile cells everywhere? Think about where you would expect to have more tactile cells. Not an extra credit question, just a question. Just a question. Okay, next up, we've got the epidermal dendritic cells. Also known as, or they used to be known as, the Langerhan cells. After good old Paul Langerhans here. Where is my Langerhan cell? There he is right there. That is our dendritic cell. It's an epidermal dendritic cell. So, there are actually dendritic cells in lots of other places in the body. These are the ones that are found in the epidermis. Okay. Dendritic cells are actually found in other places as well. They're found in the lining of your nose, your reproductive tract, um, digestive organs like the intestines. So they're all over the place. But these are the epidermal ones. The word dendritic, dendritic means like a tree. So what do trees have? Trees have branches. So dendritic cells also have branches. And this is kind of important. And we've actually hinted at this in the cells lecture. Let's suppose there are a little pathogen right there or so. By having branches, these two arms right here, these two arms can actually come inward, come in together, and then we've engulfed that pathogen. And once we've engulfed that pathogen, we can destroy him, it, chop it up, and then, this is what's amazing, the dendritic cells, once they kill and destroy something in your skin, they actually travel to your lymph nodes. You have hundreds of lymph nodes under your skin, in your body. You can see some lymph nodes in this model right here. And in the lymph nodes, the dendritic cells actually hold up the fragments of the pathogens they just destroyed and show them the white blood cells in order to activate an immune response. So pretty amazing that these skin cells will kill something in your skin, go deeper in your body, and then activate your immune system. Pretty amazing. All right. All right. So we got those three types of cells in addition to the keratinocytes. Let's go back to kind of big picture skin. There are two basic types of skin, thick skin and thin skin. Thick skin is only found on your plantar and palmar surfaces. In other words, only found on the bottom of your feet and the front of your hand. The ventral surface of your feet, the ventral surface of your hand. Palmer and plantar are both ventral. Now, thick skin has five layers and they tend to be thick. Thin skin, on the other hand, is only four layers and it's quite a bit thinner and it is found everywhere else. It does vary in its thinness. So not all thin skin is going to have the same degree of thinness. Like the skin on your eyelid is thinner than the skin on your elbow, for example. Okay, let's look at those basic five layers. So here I have thick skin. The deepest layer of my epidermis in my thick skin is called the stratum basale. The stratum basale is the deepest layer of the epidermis in thick skin. Both thick and thin skin, of course, have a dermis. It's the epidermis where the layering differences are apparent. Just superficial to the stratum basale, 
we have the stratum spinosum. So right here, just superficial to that, we've got the stratum granulosum. Superficial to that, we've got the stratum lucidum. Superficial to that, we've got the stratum corneum. So these are my five basic layers in thick skin, in my epidermis of thick skin. Thin skin, of course, lacks the stratum lucidum. And you actually looked at this stuff. We looked at the skin model in lab. Okay. If we start at the deepest part of the epidermis, we have the stratum basale, the base layer. It's just a single layer thick. It's mostly keratinocytes that are undergoing mitosis, so they're mitotic. They're undergoing mitosis because we're always shedding skin on the surface. And if we're shedding skin, we're shedding skin cells, and we need to replace those skin cells. So we're always doing some mitosis, in that stratum basale, right next to that dermis, of course. We will also find a, the occasional epidermal dendritic cell, as well as the occasional tactile cell. All right, so my stratum basale, the very deepest layer, I see it over here in my microscopic view as well. Jumping up, going superficial, we have a several layer thick one, you know what, my era, my bracket's terrible here. I just realized that. My bracket is mistaken. I actually had it too big. Dun, 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 there we go. So just right there, that's my stratum basale. Sorry about that. That's the last mistake I'm going to find this semester. I would just have to not find them because there's, there are always mistakes, aren't there? Human nature, make little flubs like this. So that's the stratum spinosum right there. Mainly keratinocytes linked together by desmosomes. So someone thought, oh wait, remember desmosomes are protein structures that anchor cells together. And someone thought these, these protein bands anchoring the desmosomes together made them look prickly or spiny. So that's where stratum spinosum spiny prickly layer comes from. Now, the cells here can still occasionally do some mitosis. I will occasionally find epidermal dendritic cells hanging out in my stratum spinosum looking for pathogens. I will also find melanocytes making that melanin, which of course gets transferred to the keratinocytes. So here's some stratum spinosum over in my microscopic view. All right, folks, what is next? Going a little more superficially in our epidermis, the next layer is the stratum granulosum. The cells are getting keratinized here, and in the process of making keratin, we end up with all these little bags, these little vesicles containing like the precursors of keratin, which are granular, and so the cell, the cells are granular, the layer is the stratum granulosum. You can see that right in here. You can see how they made the little granules in there. Always easy to see the granules. If you see the granules, you know that right below you got your stratum spinosum, right above, either lucidum or corneum, depending if it is thick or thin. Okay. Next up, we got the stratum lucidum. In the stratum lucidum, which of course when we find in thick skin, we have a few layers, and we have this protein called elidin. Now, elidin is basically this protein that's going to become keratin. Okay? Um, and the, it's clear. It's a, it's a clear protein, which is why this layer appears clear. Claire appears clear. There we go. There we go. You um, have a lot of eliden actually in your in your lips. So how do you eliden in the epidermis on your lips, which is why the underlying blood imparts a reddish color to the lips. In case you were wondering about that, now you know. Now you know. 
All right, stratum corneum. Corneum means horn. Lucidum, by the way, means clear. I didn't mention that a moment ago. Like if you're lucid, you're clear of thought. Corneum means horn. If you think back, what was that rhinoceros horn made out of? Keratin. And the stratum corneum is made of keratin. It is basically dead cells that are just chock full of keratin. Dead cells chock full of keratin. You are always shedding these cells. I'm going to hit my desk right here. You hear me hit my desk? That is me leaving epidermal cells on my desk. Leaving epidermal cells on my desk. Um, shake hands with somebody. You are going to pick up their epidermal cells. And you're going to give them some of yours. It's, it's a nice exchange. All right. The process of moving from the bacilli going upward to the corneum is called cornification. It takes about two weeks. Basically, the division of the lower cells pushes on cells above it, moving them upward. It takes about two weeks for cells to get to your corneum. They hang out there for about two weeks as well. So two weeks and two weeks, two and two. Cornification, all about two and two. Here's our stratum corneum up here. Stratum corneum is rather thick in the thick skin. Makes perfect sense. It's a lot thinner in thin skin. All right. Look at these two skin pictures right here. I will get you started. I'm going to put a D right here. I'm going to put a D right here. Okay. What I want you to do is to find all the layers in... Well, first of all, which one of these is thick? Which one of these is thin? That's an easy question. Don't mess that one up. All right, which one is thick, which one is skin? Don't be confused by the fact that we're zooming in closer on this one on the right here. So figure out which is thick, figure out which is thin. Then in each of them, try and find all the layers. Now I will tell you, it is, it is, it's, it's kind of hard to see the stratum lucidum in the, in the thick skin, but you kind of know where it is, right? It's hard to like say there, that it starts here and stops there but you kind of know where it is. Anyway, I want you to point all these guys out, all these layers out. Not really, a, not a homework question, not an extra credit question, it's something you should do to get ready for your exams. All right. And guys, with that, we are done with the epidermis. I am actually gonna end this. We're gonna have two short lectures to do the integumentary system. So I'm going to quick quit this one right here, which is fantastic and awesome, and I will see you next time.